Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. And as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting the show. And thank you for your letters. Uh, We had a great show last week, and it was comprised entirely of letters from listeners. If you'd like to support the show or send us a question or a comment, go to jeffersonhour.com. You know, David, this pandemic has really opened up some new possibilities for us. I've been doing a lot of work for governing magazine, which is headquartered in Sacramento. People can go to governing.com. And the reason that I suggest it is that on the program today, I mentioned Jack Balkin, who's written a book called The Cycles of Constitutional Time, which I found to be stunning and really clarifying. And they can find out more by going to governing. These interviews that I'm doing a couple of weeks now are with extraordinary people uh, from a wide range of perspectives, not all on government. And they wind up um, appearing in, in governing.com, and people can just go there and type my name in, and you'll see the backlog of the articles that I've been writing. I wrote one this week on the gunpowder plot in England in 1605 and how it maybe is the only historical analogy to the, the chatter we've been hearing about blowing up the entire government of the United States when President Biden delivers his State of the Union message. But I also had the chance to interview uh, this week Michael Patrick Smith. Uh, he's a musician and actor. Uh, now living in Lexington, Kentucky, but he wrote a book called The Good Hand. He came out here and spent nine months in the Bakken oil fields as a as a worker on one of the rigs, and it's a fascinating memoir about the Bakken oil boom and the kinds of people that were drawn here uh, to participate in, in one of the greatest economic um, bubbles uh, in American history for all the good and all the bad that it brought. You would like this book a great deal, Uh, David Swenson, the semi-permanent guest host. So people can go to governing.com and see all of these interviews, and some of them will find their way into the Jefferson Hour. But this is just such a rich period. I also get to do these online courses. We just finished the second round on the Constitution, our just beginning uh, four-week course on J. Robert Oppenheimer. And then following that, Shakespeare's Hamlet, the Dane, alas, poor Yorick. And so all of that is just uh, a, a source of great, joy to me. Last night, David, I was able to to lecture to several hundred people at the Smithsonian by Zoom about Theodore Roosevelt. You know, imagine this. Um, If I'd gone to the Smithsonian, it would have cost them a couple of thousand dollars to bring me there. Uh, In this case, we were in an audience would have been 80. In this case, the audience was hundreds. And thanks to Zoom technology. So things are just really fascinating. And, you know, the, the cliche, when a door closes, a window opens. That's certainly been the and, case. And soon, hopefully, uh, the doors will open, too. It sounds as if uh, the pandemic is is going to come to a close within the next six months. Yes, I got my first shot the other day. Did you? Uh, my Good left arm fell off. Um, how about you? Have you had your shot? I have had my first one. I didn't jump the queue. I waited to be uh, contacted by my physician. I went down to this place in the center of Bismarck. North Dakota, uh, a city with a population of about uh, almost 100,000 people, and uh, there was a long line. People were streaming in. There were signs as if at a rock concert. I went in. I got my preliminary little interview done in about three minutes, filled out a form, and then I went into another line, waited for maybe nine minutes, went to a table, asked, answered a few more questions, and somebody jabbed me, as the British say, with a round one, um, and I was gone 15 minutes later. It was uh, it was as efficient as you could possibly hope for. You know, I always dread these things, voting or uh, a shot or standing in line for something. I always take a book with me and a notebook in case it turns out to be an ordeal. But this was done with such great efficiency that I'm guessing they put several hundred people, maybe maybe many hundred people through that procedure in a single day. It's wonderful to see government work, to see good government and see organization. Now, obviously, it's not that way for everyone. There are people out there that are desperate to get vaccinated and and can't. But I, I do think that's going to change dramatically in the next month or two. And we have to remember, it's not like you go out to your garden and plant corn seeds and then the next day you go out and harvest it. These these vaccines, I mean, it takes, from what I understand, 70 days to finish a batch, and you you can't rush that. What's amazing to me is what has been achieved here. If we can now ramp up so that every American who wants one can get the vaccine by the 4th of July, or maybe even sooner, 
That will be one of the most successful administrative actions in American history. Just people, as you say, it takes months to, to develop these things. It takes months to cook them. Then you have to transport them. Some of them have very persnickety uh, transportation protocols. You've got to line up an army of people in every Bismarck, in every Wadena, Minnesota, in every uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, in every Tampa, Florida, to administer this stuff. It's all, some, they have to be paid. It's enormously expensive. There has to be a supply chain. You have to be able to meet expectations so that people don't come line up and not get what they need. It's a gigantic infrastructural challenge, and it's being successfully met. And by, as you say, by summer, we may have reached something close to herd immunity. And if we do, it's not that the world goes back to what it was prior to January of 2020, but it goes back closer to that world and with some improvements, thanks to the pandemic, that probably we could not otherwise have anticipated. If you add that to the fact that this occurred during the age of the digital revolution, think of that difference. If this had happened in 1990, and people could not have telecommuted, if people had not been able to meet on Zoom, if people had not been able to work from home, such people as can work from home, not everyone can, it would have been a national collapse. But this time, because of the digital revolution and because of the ubiquity of laptop computers and Zoom and Team and other technologies, we've been able to get through this. And it looks like now, for the first time, we can really see the light at the end of the tunnel, David. And I'm just totally impressed. And if, if the Trump administration deserves some of that credit, I'm thrilled to give it to them. I'm just glad it's happening. The fact that a, a vaccine that is uh, as successful as these are reported to be was developed in such a short time is really astounding to me. Before we go to the show, again, it's this week we talk about presidential appointments, about recess appointments, and about Albert Gallatin, who, uh, the more I read about him, the more they ought to do a musical about him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you said appointments. It reminds me of something that Jefferson said that did not come up in the program. He said appointments, it's appointments and disappointments. He said for everyone you name to something, you get 10 people who are your enemies, and the person you name turns out usually to be an ingrate. So before we go to the show again, thank you so much for listening again Go to jeffersonhour.com to find out more about the show, support the show, send us a question, and also to find out about Clay's online courses, uh, which I had the pleasure of attending one uh, oh, several weeks thrilled. ago. And uh, uh, maybe I'll get to be invited again sometime. But I know you have a course on Hamlet coming up that you're very excited about. You're in the midst of your Oppenheimer course now. And then you've got stuff coming up next year, and that's way too early to even talk about. And David, as we close, let me just say I'm sitting here in front of me is are the proofs of my book on North Dakota, The Language of Cottonwoods, and I'm going through it. It's been through the editing process, so they make cuts and they suggest changes and they ask for clarifications, and it's a it's a it's 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 not the happiest moment of an author's life, but it's important. And I'm going to finish this this weekend, and then I push send, and then the book goes into production, and the advanced copies will be available in April. But the actual publication date of this, I think, my most important book, will be uh, later in May. And so anyone who wants to read uh, my uh, exploration of what North Dakota signifies why it's important and where we're headed, I will, I'll be begging people to read this book. My daughter said, Dad, you idiot, you put the word North Dakota in the title, that dooms the whole project. And so uh, it's not really just about North Dakota, it's about the rural decline, it's about Red America, it's about uh, the end of the Jeffersonian family farm paradigm, it's about a spirit of place, um, it's about all sorts of things. And Thanks for indulging me and in talking about the state you and I share, David, and so few people regard. It's the last visited state and the least visited state. It's the fourth least populated state, and it's the fourth windiest state. And when Laura Bush came here at the end of the Bush administration, we asked her, why are you here? And she said, I wanted to finish. <laughs> so we we were we were her fiftieth. Well, on that note, uh, you should finish, sir. You have a lot of work to do this weekend, so you should get to it. So, uh, thanks for a great conversation this week, and we'll see you next time. Right? 
Thanks, Jefferson. Our listeners now listen to this special program about Jefferson appointments and disappointments with a particular focus on Albert Gallatin. Thanks for listening. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to the conversation this week. Mr. Jefferson, I look forward to our conversations every week. Thank you, my dear citizen. It occurred to me, I, I have been less than a gentleman in the past few conversations we've had. I, I seem to be the one that always is awarded the position of picking the subject of our conversations. And I do have one picked for this week, but sir, I, I, would, I would certainly defer to you. No, sir. I have a mind filled with all sorts of different projects. My gardens are compelling. The fields are compelling. I'm building and tearing down and rebuilding Monticello. I'm still at work at, on Poplar Forest. I have a huge correspondence. It's, a, it's drudgery. I spend several hours per day responding to letters from people I've never met or am likely to meet. I said once, uh, the life of a cabbage is superior to that of a of a letter writer. So I would gladly defer to you for whatever subject you may have in mind. You are too kind, sir. And, and the, the subject I did have in mind, sir, was uh, appointments to your cabinet. Now, I know we've talked about this before, uh, but I'd like to speak with you this week about presidential appointments, specifically cabinet positions. Uh, during your time, you had a small cabinet, I believe only five members. Government was much smaller and simpler, of course, in, in my time. I should remind everyone that the cabinet is not mentioned in the Constitution of the United States, uh, that in Article 2, which is about the executive, it's clear that the president can have advisors and that he may call upon them for written statements about their portfolios from time to time, but there's no mention of a cabinet per se in the Constitution. George Washington, the first president, developed the first cabinet and called it such, and that created a, a kind of a norm, uh, maybe what you would call a small c constitutional norm, which has been followed by every president since. I was the first secretary of state uh, in the Washington administration, and Alexander Hamilton was the first secretary of the treasury. Edmund Randolph was the attorney general, Henry Knox, uh, the secretary of war. When I became the third president of the United States on March 4th, 1801, I hadn't yet been able to put together a cabinet because, as you know, that was a very hotly contested election that went to 36 ballots in the House of Representatives before it was finally resolved. So between February 17th, when that decision was finally made by the House of Representatives, I had just a couple of weeks to put together my cabinet. I chose my closest friend and my most trusted advisor, James Madison of Virginia, to be the Secretary of State, the most important portfolio of them. And I made Robert Smith the Secretary of Navy. He was not my first choice, uh, but he certainly uh, performed ably in that function. The Attorney General was a man named Levi Lincoln, from Massachusetts. I tried to have geographic diversity in my choices, and I wanted to have several cabinet ministers from the enemy ground or adversarial ground up in New England. But the attorney general was not required to be in residence in the national capital and, in fact, was, um, was encouraged to maintain his own law practice at that time. That office was not yet as important as it subsequently became. My secretary of war was Henry Dearborn, he turned out to be an excellent choice. And then my Secretary of the Treasury uh, was Albert Gallatin, a French-speaking, Swiss-born, recent immigrant to the United States. Uh, he had been a, a particular friend of my political vision in the Congress of the United States, and he was a financier with every bit as much talent as Alexander Hamilton and possibly more. So it didn't take me very long to determine that he should be the Secretary of the Treasury, the, the second most important member of the cabinet. Yes, I'd like to talk about Mr. Gallatin more, but first, uh, I'd like to talk about the methodology of appointing these cabinet members. 
Uh, you, you know, sir, during my time, the cabinet has ballooned to over 20 members. I, I don't know if you can imagine that, sir. That is a very large centralized government. It's hard to believe that there could be that many portfolios that need to be handled. I will say that the Secretary of State was a sort of a grab bag position in my time. When I came back from France in the autumn of 1789 and discovered upon reaching Norfolk that I had been named by George Washington to be his Secretary of State and already confirmed by the Senate, I was mostly worried about what that job would entail, that it might be too large a portfolio for my tastes. And I wrote to George Washington, of course, accepting the appointment. How can you turn George Washington down at so important a moment in our early national history? But I wanted assurances that the portfolio would be limited, and Washington assured me that this would be kept within bounds. So the Secretary of State had a bigger uh, portfolio than he does in your time, although perhaps not so important. And therefore, that's why I had no difficulty in choosing James Madison to be the Secretary of State. At the time, it was sort of the path to the presidency, uh, and he did succeed me in 1809. But the other cabinet members were equally important uh, to our small national government. I chose people that I could trust, I wanted a harmonious cabinet, and I had seen the disharmony in the Adams cabinet, and I had been part of the disharmony in the Washington cabinet. Uh, Adams inherited his cabinet ministers from George Washington. In other words, he kept them on. Uh, He should have wiped the slate clean and appointed people of his own style and people that he had greater trust in, but he didn't. He thought that it was the duty of of, of what he called himself the heir apparent to maintain Washington's cabinet, and that proved to be one of the probably the worst mistake that John Adams made in his one-term presidency. So I had two previous administrations to look at, and I had been involved in all those disputes with Hamilton and had found it intolerable and had retired before George Washington because I just did not want that much animosity and conflict in my life. And I also sensed that I wasn't really very effective because Hamilton was by far the favorite son and the one that Washington agreed with most in making decisions as president. So that was a negative example for me. And then what I observed as vice president to John Adams of his own cabinet, openly in rebellion against him, uh, dealing secretly with Alexander Hamilton, who by now was in New York as a kind of shadow president, fundamentally disloyal to John Adams and disharmonious to the highest degree. I I realized that was certainly what I didn't want. So my main criterion for selecting my own cabinet ministers was people that I could get along with who shared my view of America, who would be team players, to use a term from your own time. And that, more than anything else, convinced me of the choices that I made. Well, as you say, sir, uh, there was no constitutional provision for a presidential cabinet that was a precedent that was established by President Washington. But there are constitutional provisions for appointing officials in the government. So the the first would be the appointments clause, which gives the president the authority to make appointments with the advice and consent of the Senate. I do have that article in front of me, although I'm certain that you're familiar with it. Indeed. So if I chose, say, Madison to be my secretary of state, the United States Senate would sit in judgment of that appointment and decide by majority rule whether he was confirmed as my secretary of state. And all of my cabinet members, by the way, were easily confirmed. Although I should say that I made the appointment of the secretary of treasury, Albert Gallatin, what's called a recess appointment. I made it when the Congress was in recess. I did that for two reasons. First of all, they recessed for an awful long time back then. And so I needed to get on with the most important thing I needed to do, which was to balance the budget and to begin to pay off Mr. Hamilton's national debt. I couldn't wait until Congress came back in December of 1801. So I appointed Gallatin when they were back in their home districts. That's what's known as a recess appointment. I also used recess appointment because Gallatin was a very controversial figure. He had been an outspoken small r Republican of my own political persuasion while a member of Congress He had denounced uh, Federalists at different times. He had made some enemies because he was as partisan and as passionate in his uh, Republican politics as he was. And so I knew that if I presented him 
uh, to Congress that there would be some significant debate, let's say, before he was confirmed. I had no doubt that he would be confirmed, but by making it a recess appointment, I made it much easier on Congress when they came back in the autumn of 1801, and then that bled over into the beginnings of 1802. They readily confirmed him. The fact that he was there and had already begun to do work and had disarmed many of his critics and had shown that he, as a cabinet minister, was essentially nonpartisan, uh, that made the, such Federalists as, as still remained in Congress less likely to oppose uh, the confirmation of him. You bring up the recess clause, the recess appointments clause, which I'm hoping you can explain to myself and our audience better, sir. It's Article 2, Section 2, Clause 3, and it reads, the president shall have the power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. That's correct. So remember that I lived in a three-mile-per-hour world, and it was a profoundly agrarian society. Congress met for only a few weeks per year. It wanted to work around the growing season so that uh, representatives and senators who were farmers, and almost everybody was, could get home to manage their private affairs. And so we not much was at stake. Uh, we didn't need a full-time Congress of the United States, so they met a few weeks per annum uh, spread across the calendar. That meant that there were more times when there was no Congress in session than times when it indeed was sitting. And so the Constitution makers understood that the president would need to have his advisors, what became the cabinet, and that he couldn't wait months and months for Congress to turn back up, that he needed to get on with the business of whatever portfolio it was, whether it's the Secretary of War or the Secretary of the Navy or the um, Secretary of State or in this case, the Secretary of the Treasury. And so they wisely uh, gave the executive, the only person who has to stay in, in, um, in his official duties year-round, they gave him this capacity to make a recess appointments. But it also then it soon became clear that it was a way to ease a somewhat controversial figure into the government so that you could do it by recess appointment. Then when Congress reconvenes, it's harder to undo uh, that appointment than it is simply to confirm it. And, and But if they do nothing, as you say, that, that, uh, uh, that appointment then is voided at the end of the session. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. We need to take just a short break, but we'll return to this conversation in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week, we're speaking with President Jefferson about presidential appointments, specifically now about recess appointments. Mr. Jefferson, I'm left to think by what you just said that recess appointments were added as almost a safeguard to ensure continuity in government. In fact, Alexander Hamilton referred to the recess appointments as nothing more than a supplement for the purpose of establishing an auxiliary method of appointment in cases to which the general method was inadequate. Yes, he's, that's exactly right. The president can call Congress back into session, but it's not something you want to do to fill a single cabinet position or a couple of them. Uh, I was very reluctant to have emergency sessions of the Congress of the United States. In fact, the more they stayed at home, the happier that I generally was because I could get some work done when they weren't in the federal capital. And so the Constitution makers understood that Congress could not always be counted on to be present but we did need the essential functions of the national government to continue, and therefore recess appointments would, would make it possible for the president to carry on and not call Congress back into emergency session every time there was a vacancy. Edmund Randolph in July of 1792 wrote that the spirit of the Constitution favors the participation of the Senate in all appointments, but as it may be necessary oftentimes to fill up vacancies when it may be inconvenient to summon the Senate, a temporary commission may be granted by the president. Exactly so. Uh, that's what we've been saying. But but as I'm, as I'm also pointing out, uh, I realized that a recess appointment had a certain political strategy to it also. Uh, that I could ease Gallatin into his post uh, more quickly by recess appointment than if I had just faced the Senate head on and let them squabble over this for a couple of weeks. Gallatin was a recess appointment, sir. 
Um, you had high respect for him. You wrote he was the only man in the United States who understood through the labyrinths Hamilton involved it in, the precise state of the treasury. Yes, I don't understand economics. Everyone knows that I died bankrupt, but but more than that, I simply don't, I'm not able to think in economic terms. I can do books and I can figure out profit and loss and so on, but we're talking about another order of uh, intellectual capacity. When we when we talk about financing a great nation, it's national debt, um, how currency shall be exchanged, um, you know, state debt, national debt, personal debt, whether we need banks and clearing houses, how can we make sure our own fiscal affairs are sufficiently in order that other nations are willing to uh, give us loans when we need them. It's a very, very complex business, and it had been pioneered uh, partly in the, the continent, in France, but England had really done the great work in developing the modern financial state. And Hamilton, who was interested in money and in monetary policy, had studied the Bank of England, had studied Britain's uh, handling of its own uh, national debt and so on. And so he brought a fair level of, I would say, mastery, even genius, to that question. But I didn't like Hamilton's policies because he loved a national debt. He favored the financial class. He favored the, the establishment in the banking world and in the commercial world and in the world of trade and had less interest in the real business of America, which at the time was family farming and agriculture. And he was much more devoted to the commercial world of New England than he was to the agrarian world south of Maryland. And the national debt, I think, his gift to America was a ruinous Thing, disaster, really. So I wanted someone to be my Secretary of the Treasury who was as um, had the capacity of Hamilton or more, but who had a better ideology, who had a better understanding of, of the purposes of our centralized financial system, and that was Albert Gallatin. And when he became my Secretary of the Treasury, he knew exactly what I intended. I said to him that the number one purpose of my administration would be to retire as much of the national debt as possible. And by that, I meant we were going to strain in every possible way to pay off as much of the national debt as could be done and maintain some minimal financing of the other functions of government, that we were not going to do any of the things that I might have wanted to do, a national museum, a national university, a system of, of, of libraries in every community, new roads, etc. All of that was going to have to wait until such time as we got our financial house in order. And that meant we had to retire as much of this ruinous national debt that Hamilton had given us as possible. And this was going to make for a really difficult administration because there were so many things that I would have liked to have done. I mean, I, I like to envision uh, a future of great prosperity and culture and national civilization and a vibrant intellectual and artistic uh, life, but I didn't think that we could do those things until such time as we had gotten the national debt under control. And so poor Gallatin knew that he was going to be the least popular member of my administration because his his position was going to be to say no. If I wanted to do something, he was going to say, how are we going to finance this? And I thought you wanted to retire the national debt, and the only way we can retire the national debt is to devote 73% of our annual revenues to debt retirement. There's no other way to get that done. You can't grow the economy enough to absorb the debt. You have to actually sit down and address it in real terms and with real sacrifice. Mr. Gallatin, as you have stated, received a recess appointment from you in May 1801. And then, as you have also stated, he was confirmed by the Senate in January 1802. Uh, now, I've read historically that along with yourself and Secretary of State Madison, Gallatin was one of the three key officials in your administration. You and Madison would spend the majority of the summer months at your homes while Gallatin was frequently left to preside over the operation of the federal government. He was the only one who was willing to stay in the the miasmic and fetid atmosphere of the Potomac in those months. You know, I said um, I would never voluntarily spend the months of August and September in, in D.C. or in the lower Chesapeake. And that's why I built Monticello up in the mountains, because those um, areas near the coast were so humid and so uh, unhealthy. They were breeding grounds for all the plagues and diseases that were 
still ravaging uh, the human constitution in the early 19th century. And so I always went back to Monticello in the worst two months, in August and September. And, and Madison, of course, lived about 30 miles away from Monticello, so we were essentially neighbors. He could get to Monticello in a single day, or I could get to Montpelier in a single day. So we were able to continue our work, uh, and we had a closer relationship than I did with Gallatin or than Madison did with Gallatin. But Gallatin knew that he was, in some ways, the continuity of the government, that the, the Treasury Department is the one that you cannot neglect even for a week. And so he tended to stay in the District of Columbia, and then he was able to handle certain affairs for the others of us who had scattered in those months. The more I read about Mr. Gallatin, the more fascinating he becomes. I, I wonder if he gets uh, his due respect for all he did during your administration, sir. Well, it's Hamilton, 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 isn't it? And that's all we ever hear about. And that's not fair because uh, Hamilton was a great man, but he had a very uh, un-American vision. He was a monarchist. In fact, he was for hereditary monarchy, and he made no effort to conceal the fact that he preferred what he called the wise, the rich, and the well-born to the 99% of the American people who were just good, solid farmers and American citizens. Let me say this much more about Gallatin. You know, we've only talked about his capacity as a financier. He was also a man of letters, and more important than that, he was a student of Indian languages. So here were all these native peoples, you know, hundreds of different tribes, many different dialects. We didn't really know what to make of it. You know, why would there be a scattered tribe here with a certain dialect and then one only 80 or 150 miles away with a completely different language group? Where did they come from? Um, were their languages related to Asiatic or Siberian languages in any way? Uh, these were open questions and filled with mystery and uncertainty. Uh, when I sent Meriwether Lewis up the Missouri River in 1804, I sent a blank vocabulary grid of 250 common words like husband, wife, birth, death, sun, moon, stars, etc. And I asked him to fill in that vocabulary grid with the languages of the peoples that he met if there were leisure enough time to do it. And he did. He brought back 29 vocabularies, which was an enormous amount of effort on his behalf. There's a sad ending to that story, but I, I, I won't speak to it now. But Gallatin was fascinated by this. In fact, Gallatin played a role in helping me to construct the instructions to Meriwether Lewis, which I issued in June of 1803. And Gallatin wanted to know about these languages and maybe language classification. And so later, years later, Gallatin was one of the first in America to create a tentative classification of Indian languages. And as you all know, in your time, there are different groups. There's a Suyan group, and there's a Kadoan group, and there's an Algonquin group, and so on. And this has been refined in the course of ethnography and linguistic science to the point in your time where it's very well understood, but in mine, not so much. And Gallatin was one of the first to begin the arduous work of comparing the word for sun in Shoshone with the word for sun in Ojibwe, and trying to figure out which of these scattered tribes had common linguistic roots and which had distinct linguistic roots. So his work in that regard, mapping, and in linguistics, comparative Native American linguistics, this is of extraordinary importance to the Enlightenment, arguably more important than his, um, his good work uh, about American finance. History tells us that he was a strong supporter of the Louisiana Purchase, and in fact, he helped convince you you had some doubts about its constitutionality. Well, it was unconstitutional, technically speaking. You know, I'm, I'm a strict constructionist, and I believe that the Constitution enumerates the powers of government. And so I took that to be uh, the guide to what government's powers should be, especially for the legislative branch. You know, there is a set of enumerated powers, coining money, waging war, conscripting soldiers, etc. Uh, all those things are uh, explicitly laid out in Article I of the Constitution of the United States. So I believe that that was the list, and that if the Founding Fathers had intended other things for us to do, like a national bank, for example, something Hamilton wanted, that if it wasn't enumerated in the Constitution, that meant we needed an enabling amendment to the Constitution to let us do that. And so when Napoleon dropped the Louisiana Territory into my lap, 828,000 square miles for three cents per acre, of course I wanted to make that sale. That would be the making moment of America's destiny. 
But I did honestly believe that it was unconstitutional according to my narrow reading of what the Constitution uh, enabled. And so it took Madison, the Secretary of State, and Gallatin, the Secretary of the Treasury, to calm me down. And they both said, look, if you get the chance to double the size of the United States for three cents per acre, you must find a way to do it. And we will finesse the constitutional question somehow, but history will vindicate your making this purchase. It would be insane to turn down the Louisiana Purchase on the basis of a constitutional theory. Such a thing has never happened in the history of the world. Such a thing is never likely to happen again. You might have to go to war to pick up the state of Alabama or war to keep the southern uh, banks of the Mississippi open. Now it's being handed to you by Napoleon Bonaparte for pennies. You just have to say yes. And so I allowed myself to be convinced, although I, to this day, I feel a certain anxiety about having violated my theory of the Constitution. The two of you also shared a real opposition to a national debt. It's said that Gallatin regarded national debts as a breeding ground for public corruption. Of course. Uh, first of all, it attaches a certain element of the population to your government, and Hamilton did it on purpose. He said that the national debt uh, would bring uh, the financial class into cahoots uh, with his administration, and this would make them favor the centralized government of the United States, and that would make the country stronger. And I grant his point, but I disagree with it even so. And, and I also, with Gallatin, believe that a national debt invites mischief. So let's say that I want to go to war with you know, Canada. I can't do that without Congress appropriating money to fight that war. And so I have to go to Congress, and I have to say, I need, let's say, $10 million to fight a war against Canada. I want you to appropriate that money. Then they debate, and some people think it's a bad idea to go to war. Some people think it's the bad time to go to war. Some people think we can do it on the cheap. Some people think that we need much more than $10 million. But there is a lively and important democratic debate about the wisdom of going to war against Canada because the House of Representatives controls the purse strings, and I can't do anything without their approval. But let's say that I can just borrow the money. Uh, if we have a national debt, I just borrow the money. Now I can fight that war using Dutch funds or British funds or French funds. The people have been moved out of the equation. Their capacity to control the destiny of the nation on this most important of questions, war, that is the bloodshed of their children, has been removed by my capacity to finesse the war without raising taxes. And so... It's essential that we rein in the capacity of government to do things that are not endorsed by the Congress of the United States, the body in our Constitution that leans most completely on the actual sovereign, the people. So a national debt has that capacity of inviting mischief. The other thing that it invites is the pauperization of our grandchildren. You know, the generation that undertakes a national debt almost never pays it off. I wanted the generation that undertook a debt to pay it off in its entirety and not simply offload it onto the innocent. You know, the, the, our children and our grandchildren are not consulted when we enter into a national debt. They just wind up having to pay it off. And so on the principle that there must be consent of the governed for every important thing that happens in a free society, then our children should not have to pay off a national debt that we undertook because we were lazy or we didn't have fiscal good sense. Well, finally, Mr. Jefferson, you, as you well know, our current presidential administration is in the process of making appointments. When is it justified to use recess appointments in order to gain the appointments a president desires? Well, first, let me say that I could not agree with you more. When you elect a president, you must give him the scope to surround himself with by people of his own choice. You may not approve of them, but elections matter. And so the president, in my opinion, has a right to surround himself by people of his own stamp. And the only thing that Congress should do, the Senate should do in its capacity for advice and consent, is to determine whether the person nominated has the capacity to, to do the job. In other words, it's about competence it's not about partisanship. It's not about politics. It's about competence. 
if you think that the person is corrupt or if you think that he's mediocre or if you think that he's the brother-in-law of the president's cousin, you have a right to deny that appointment. But essentially, the Senate's attitude should be, of course, we will confirm unless there is some very, very compelling reason not to confirm. And because of that, I believe that the recess appointment should only be used when there's an actual recess and we need to fill a vacancy or when there is some reason to think that uh, the wrong kind of partisanship will get in the way, which is what happened with Gallatin. So in the course of my eight years as president, I nominated three members to the Supreme Court of the United States. I also nominated seven men to the circuit courts and eight to the district courts. But the three Supreme Court justices, of course, are the ones that get all of the attention in American constitutional society. And they were as follows. William Johnson of South Carolina. I appointed him in 1804. Henry Livingston of New York. I appointed in 1806. And Thomas Todd of Virginia and Kentucky. I appointed in 1807. And in each case, they sailed through because the Senate of the United States rightly understood that the president should make these nominations and that this should not become a partisan matter. Uh, I must tell you, uh, alas, that all three of them wound up disappointing me to a certain extent, although William Johnson of South Carolina was the the closest to a, a Jeffersonian Republican of the three. The problem with life appointments, as I'm sure you can appreciate, is that once you've given them a a life-tenured position, they no longer owe you a thing, and they turn out to be more independent on the court than you might have expected when you lifted them out of obscurity and put them into these offices. Thank you so very much, Mr. Jefferson. You are most welcome, sir. We're going to take a short break. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this edition of The Thomas Jefferson Hour. I have removed my wig and tights and buckled shoes and put them back into the Jeffersonian closet. And I now sit virtually across from the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. David Swenson. Hello, David. Good to talk to you. As always, good to talk with uh, Jefferson. I almost wondered in the beginning of the program when I offered him the opportunity to pick uh, a uh, subject for conversation this week, if he would allow me to continue with what I had planned, or if he would say, well, you know, I've been reading this new book. (laughs) Well, I have been reading this new book, and I heartily recommend it, my friend. It is by Jack Balkan, and it's called The Cycles of Constitutional Time. Jack Balkan, The Cycles of Constitutional Time. And here's what it's about. He thinks that uh, there are deeper structures, and he divides our history into a number of eras, It's very compelling. He says, for example, that the first era was the Federalist era from 1788 until 1800. That's when Jefferson was elected. And then we have the Jeffersonian era from 1809 until 1828 with the coming of Andrew Jackson. And then we have the Jacksonian era until the Civil War. After the Civil War, we have this long period of Republican domination that extends from 1865 until... Uh, the New Deal, until 1932. Then you have the Roosevelt, the Franklin Roosevelt Revolution in 1932, the New Deal, and he sees that continuing through the administration of of Jimmy Carter. And then the Reagan uh, Revolution beginning in 1980 continues to this day, but he thinks that it's now reached its end game. And he goes on to say, after making this ingenious analysis of these different eras, he goes on to say that the last president in a in a cycle tends to be a failed one-term president. And so, for example, John Adams is the last president of the Federalist period, and he gets one term. John Quincy Adams is the last president of the Jeffersonian period. He gets one term. Uh, we have Herbert Hoover, who's replaced in 1932 Uh, by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Jimmy Carter is the last of the New Deal presidents. He gets a single term, and he believes that uh, Donald Trump is the last in the period of the Reagan Revolution, and he was retired after a single term. And he believes, uh, does Jack Balkan of the cycles of constitutional time, that we are ripe for a new progressive era, a second progressive era, and believes that we will come out of this period of deep gridlock and and, and hyper-partisanship and move into a new progressive era where a lot of things get done that have needed to be done for a long time. 
And he's not particularly a, a progressive liberal. He's really looking at this as a political historian and political theorist. I found it extremely interesting. I had the chance to interview him for Governing Magazine. People will be able to see that interview shortly in, at governing.com. But his name is Jack Balkan, and it's called The Cycles of Constitutional Time. And here's why I recommend it so highly, David. You know, we, we've we been in this thing. We're in the middle of this miasma, this cauldron, this nightmare, whatever we, we want to call it. And I don't just mean the Trump era. I mean the partisanship and the gridlock and so on. Um, we can't see very straight because we're in it. So he takes it up to about 35,000 feet, and he looks down at this and, and tries to discern patterns of American history. And he sees this pattern, and he feels that we have reached the end of the Reagan Revolution, the New Deal under Franklin Roosevelt, said the government could do some very important things, and it did. But when Ronald Reagan became president in 1980, he said the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And Reagan and his followers believed that government had overreached and we needed to pull back on the intrusiveness and regulatory authority and tax authority of the national government. And so we've seen that play itself out even William Jefferson Clinton said the era of big government is over. So now we've played that dynamic out and it ended with the Trump one-term presidency. And now he thinks that the, the pendulum is shifting and we're going to realize, and the pandemic, of course, is a big part of this, that there are times when we actually do really need a strong coordinating central government. He believes that the biggest mistake that Donald Trump made was not using the capacity of the national government to attend to the pandemic, that he essentially just shrugged his shoulders and and did not use the federal government as a significant coordinating force in our national response to the pandemic. And, and because of that, he lost his reelection in 2020. And now the Biden administration is more comfortable with government. And if it can come through, if it can really deliver solutions or some solutions to our problems, if it can fix some things and make government work again, that it will be rewarded with re-election and a, 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 a sustained period of at least moderate progressive American political domination. So we'll see. But it really helps me to be able to look at this from that perspective, from that sort of 38,000 feet perspective and look down and try to clarify the confused world that we've been living in for the past five or 10 years. I really want to talk about Gallatin some more because uh, he was the subject of our conversation with Jefferson, and he's kind of a, a a major player that possibly doesn't get his due, and also about presidential appointments. But you brought up books, so I'm going to match you with a couple, if I might. Yes, sir. I've I've uh, done what I rarely do, and and that's read some fiction at the recommendation of my uh, sister Joanne. And a book called All the Light We Cannot See. It's a great book. It came out in 2014, uh, won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction and the uh, Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. Terrific read. Really good. It's, uh, it's, it's set in occupied France during World War II and centers on a blind French girl and a German boy whose paths eventually crossed. That's all I'll say. All the Light We Cannot See. And the other one is The British Are Coming, The War for America, Lexington to Princeton, which I'm in the midst of reading now. I'd say the first of a trilogy of books planned by the author is Rick Atkinson, which I'm hoping we can get on the show sometime in the future, an interview. Terrific writer, uh, military history. Um, I know Joe Ellis wrote an unsolicited raving review about this book after it came out. He's raving positive about this. It's called the British Are Coming, The War for America by Rick Atkinson, the first of a trilogy. Right. But can we go back to Gallatin and uh, presidential appointments? Yes. But let me start by saying, I, I'm sure you knew that Gallatin played that significant role in, in Native American language classification, but I think that's just stunning. Uh, you know, we now, John Wesley Powell, one of my heroes, was involved in this too. You know, there's been, at times there were five, six major language groups, at times more. Now they've reduced them really to three. But what this kind of comparative linguistics is so very important. And Gallatin had a fascination that even Jefferson did not have with a taxonomy, a kind of an enlightenment taxonomy of the indigenous peoples of North America. That's a whole separate world 
for Gallatin that has nothing to do with government finance. He was Swiss born, isn't that right? That is right. And he was kind of like, a, he had a mentality of the small shopkeeper and in independence, and he, he brought that with him to America. Yes, he was, uh, according to the Federalists, uh, you know, a radical, a French radical, foreign born, heavy accent, French manners. And so it was easy for them to either ridicule Gallatin or to uh, to find him dangerous. But it turned out that Jefferson was absolutely right, that Gallatin was as brilliant a financial thinker and planner as the great Hamilton. And it's it's unfair historically that Hamilton has risen so high in the nation's uh, memory and that Gallatin is a largely forgotten figure when he doesn't deserve it at all to be. You know, we talked with Mr. Jefferson about uh, Gallatin's um, distaste, if that's the right word, for national debt. He really believed that, and we could use this today, that national debt is a source of corruption and tyranny, and he halved the national debt during Jefferson's term. Maybe, certainly 37%. I mean, he did more than anybody else had ever done or anyone else has subsequently done he really he took Jefferson very seriously, and Jefferson was very serious. But as you know, Jefferson was a spendthrift who also understood the need to retire the national debt. So Gallatin had to be the the the, the scold in the Jefferson administration, constantly saying, "But if you do that, then that will extend the time before we can retire the national debt." And I thought I heard you say, Mr. President, that your number one goal was to reduce the national debt. So if you really mean that. And so Jefferson, of course, uh, appreciated that, but also found it annoying. Uh, but Gallatin played this very important and significant role in chastening Jefferson's capacity otherwise to spend on all sorts of desirabilities. Yeah, in our conversation today, Jefferson acknowledged that. But you, you start reading about Gallatin and all the things he did. Not only did he reduce the national debt, I think you said 37%. I, I read 83 million down to 45.2 million, but he also reduced taxes wherever he could and dramatically reduced military spending. And what the Jefferson administration proved is you can, if you really want to, live within your means, you know, so that you start by saying, well, okay, our, we, let's say we have a trillion dollar budget. Uh, what can we trim? And then you go, okay, you can trim the National Pumpkin uh, Society and you can trim the Defense uh, Educational Fund and so on. But once you've thrown away the easy stuff that you know almost anyone could agree is not absolutely necessary, you wind up with almost everything seeming to one constituency or another to be essential to the future of human civilization. And so we always try to make a run at this, uh, especially conservative Republican administrations, and they wind up throwing up their hands because you just can't really get at it. But what Jefferson and Gallatin showed was you can do it if you want to, and you should do it. It's a moral question for Jefferson, not just a fiscal question. It's a moral question because it means that we are taxing our children and our grandchildren without their consent. And so uh, now, someone would say, oh, life was so much easier then, the national government had very few functions, or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is that Jefferson said, we're going to do it. And now I'm asking you, Gallatin, to find the mechanism to get it done. And meanwhile, I want you to reduce taxes. In other words, we're not just going to raise taxes to meet the debt. We're going to lower taxes to, to, to um, decrease the burden on average American citizens and at the same time, we're going to lower government expenditures to meet the tax base that we have. And in addition to that, we're going to have a surplus every year so that we can pay off and service the national debt. I mean, there's no administration today that can do that. They can talk about it if they want, but they can't do it because it's gotten too far out of whack and there are too many lobbies and constituencies and it's easy to mobilize people for almost any government entity but we also have lost the moral understanding that a national debt is a really uh, risky thing to do to the unborn, if you believe in the idea of consent of the governed. In the time we have left, I really want to talk about recess appointments then and now. But before we leave Mr. Gallatin, I think it's uh, noteworthy that he had a pretty, pretty good political sense as well. 
He was opposed to the Embargo Act of 1807, and Jefferson did it anyway, and that really led to his the demise of his popularity. Yeah, so, so Jefferson and Madison had this idea that you could replace war with economic coercion. This starts way back during the Revolution, and they got this idea in their head that we can have embargoes and, and boycotts and, and uh, economic war can replace you know, soldiers with bayonets. And so this was their... F- what the French call an idée fixe. It was a, it was their fixed obsessive idea. And every time there was a problem, Jefferson and Madison, in this case, their best friendship, uh, really egged each other on in a negative fashion. They always said, "Oh, let's just try an embargo." So then, in eighteen seven, eight, and nine, uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, when America really was getting ground up by Britain and France, caught in the middle of this world conflagration. Jefferson and Madison went to the well and said, hi, how about an economic embargo? And Gallatin said, first of all, this doesn't work. And second of all, it's going to be harder on us than it will be on our enemies. It's really a bad idea. But he said, if you if you want to do it, I will make it happen. I'll make it work. And so then as a very loyal Jeffersonian, even though he disagreed profoundly with the policy, he became the number one figure in making the embargo acts have teeth and work to the extent that they did. They were eventually um, rescinded, uh, partly in the last days of the Jefferson administration, and then more so uh, in the Madison administration. They had failed, although Jefferson would say, hey, look, they kept us out of war, and they gave us a little more time to build up a national pride and a national treasury so that when we did fight the War of 1812, we were better prepared than we otherwise would have been. In the couple of minutes that we have left, I wanted to talk a bit more about recess appointments. Jefferson used that. I mean, it's in the Constitution. You can do it. And he used that to get the guy he wanted. And as you said, you know, politically then it was hard to take him away. Looking at the current administration, how do you how do you compare those two? I I believe so strongly that Jefferson is right, that that the president has a right to surround himself or herself with the people that they want in these offices. And I really find it very deeply troubling when we get a nominee for the Supreme Court and it becomes a political football and there's this wrangling and undermining and these ridiculous congressional hearings in which nothing is ever uh, accomplished or revealed and people just are posturing and doing speechifying and so on. The fact is that elections matter. Donald Trump was elected president. Vacancies came up in the Supreme Court and in the lower courts. He had an absolute right to fill them, and Congress needed to determine whether these people were competent, which, by the way, not all of them were, but most of them were, and that's the end of it. And so we need to move back, in my opinion, to this view. And I resent it that that, uh, people that Joe Biden has has nominated are, are, are having a rough go in the United States Senate and you know we know that very little of this has to do with their competence most of it has to do with partisan politics and it's it's ruinous it it's it's silly and and that's one reason that Donald Trump used temporary appointments acting this and acting that because he didn't have to make them pass muster in the United States Senate even amongst his own Republican party and so we're in this position where this has gotten so out of control that it really hamstrings a new president's capacity to build the team that he needs or she needs to get the work done that they said they were going to do when they were dutifully elected to the presidency of the United States. So I don't think the recess appointments work in quite the same way anymore. And Congress is not in recess as much as it once was. Um, And I don't think it's a very useful tool for filling cabinet positions because the same people will just come back and they have to they have to affirm uh, the appointment at some point, and they're going to come back after such people. Uh, but it does happen uh, in, in our time, but it's, it's relatively rare. What do you think? I think it's time to say goodbye for this week, sadly. I've enjoyed this conversation very much. Go to jeffersonhour.com to find out more about the Jefferson Hour or support the show, and we certainly appreciate that. And with that, sir, uh, I look forward to next week. And we'll see you, everybody. Go to the website, maybe take this course on Hamlet, Shakespeare's greatest tragedy and maybe the finest thing in English literature. But for now, thank you all of you, and we will see you next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour.
The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson.